Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hi, everyone. Um, first of all, just to say thanks to our host um, for giving me the opportunity to talk today. Uh, and thanks to you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening, hopefully. <clears throat> um, I know it's getting to the end of the day, so I'm sure you're all getting a bit um, itchy, as it were, to move on. So I'll try and keep it... Uh, entertaining, <laughs> or at least a bit entertaining, um, <clears throat> and interesting, and if nothing else, at least brief. Um, so yeah, so I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, technology and some of the things we're doing um, at Broadridge. But first, who Broadridge is, um, so perhaps we're more well known to, um, to, to banks than, than issuers. Um, our, our core role in investor communications is supporting the communication between investors and issuers, and particularly for, for cross-border investors. So um, part of that is, is outside of proxy, but a good part of that is during the general meeting. And in terms of votes at general meetings, about 80% of international votes go through our systems um, with those international investors using our tools to understand what meetings are out there um, and, and how to vote. So, so that's who Broadridge is. We've got a huge network. We connect corporate issuers to, as I say, to investors through banks and brokers. Uh, I'm Chris Kelly. Um, yeah, I'm a product manager. I cover uh, Europe for, for Broadridge. Um, so my remit is both regulatory engagement and market engagement, as well as um, technology, uh, and understanding how we can use technology both now and in the future. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm also, I suppose, um, I don't always like just talking about theory. So today I thought it might be interesting to look at um, actual opportunities and maybe think about what might change for, for issuers um, over the next few years as a result of technology change and some of the things that we're doing. So I'll start with um, just, just three observations for, for what, um, what that landscape may look like. And some of these we're seeing right now in, in perhaps smaller ways. So um, obviously we have Georgian here. Um, <clears throat> we spoke to um, Perk and, and heard from other um, researchers and indeed um, people working in capital markets uh, and a lot of that's been around dialogue between investors and issuers but um, we see technology as, a, as an enabler for greater degrees of dialogue between investors and issuers so of course um, someone like State Street Global Advisors have enough capital and a big enough team to engage with, with companies um, but there's lots of you know, lots of much smaller asset managers out there who maybe do less of that, who take better advantage of, of research firms to understand uh, the companies in which they invest. Um, but we think that's going to change over time. Uh, another um, potential observation, it doesn't happen much, but there's been a lot of talk about this, whether it's in the UK's corporate governance code or other corporate governance codes, about investors working cooperatively. How can investors work together to achieve desired change in a company? Um, <clears throat> but we see technology as, as, again, being an enabler of that. And finally, emergence of retail investors and the importance in, in governance outcomes. So the market for, for voting in North America is very different to the rest of the world. Um, <clears throat> and, and there's a very different structure. But what we've seen there is a result of you know, perhaps a more costly um, structure of voting. So retail investors are becoming increasingly critical um, where there's uh, a contested election. Uh, so engagement with retail investors, which is really only starting to pick up in Europe, I think is going to become um, an increasing Im importance. So hopefully I'll, I'll talk through just a couple of technologies, why we think that's going to change, and perhaps um, you, know, you might start to think about how you're going to take advantage of those technologies as they emerge so that these things can be a positive for you as, as companies rather than necessarily a negative. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time on education or anything like that, um, but just very briefly, um, so one area um, that we're working with is artificial intelligence which is, um, <clears throat> I mean, you can see a definition there, but it's generally self-learning intelligence, so algorithms that, if you like, can mimic to some degree what a human analyst might do. There are lots of areas, but three core areas that you might read a lot about, and you probably read more about computer vision and robotics. Those are kind of technologies using, say, self-driving cars. Um, <clears throat> but there's also natural language processing. That's a lot of the work that um, researchers do today in interpreting written text and coming to conclusions about it. 
So <clears throat> in terms of how we've used NLP, and this is really um, sort of very early, and I know the screenshot isn't telling you much, this is um, what a, an institutional investor will see when they're going in to um, vote uh, an AGM of a company. You can see there you've got the elections, running down the options for that investor. Now today, most investors will use uh, research firms to decide how to vote, but we're starting to take in analytics, other data points, so that individual investors can decide what their policy is and use that to very quickly um, highlight where a resolution <clears throat> might be in line with their policy or against it. So, you know, some of those data points are really simple. We're seeing the emergence of pay ratios, for instance, um, in disclosures. But we're able to search through those disclosures automatically, pull out the pay ratio, and provide it as a data point so that an institutional investor can go in and say, well, if the pay ratio is over this amount, then I want to highlight that resolution, and then I'm going to look into it more. Um, um, what might this lead to? There's probably not going to be a wholesale change. NLP is a very difficult topic, um, and likely research firms will still be here for a long time to come. But you know, some of those research firms I know are investing in areas like this, and we think this is going to change perhaps the cycle. So <clears throat> rather than investors waiting a long time, um, perhaps towards much closer to the, to the meeting to vote, instead they'll have this information almost straight away because an AI, as long as it has enough server space, can just, can just run instantly. Whereas if, you, if you're in the middle of a proxy season with a team of analysts, you have to wait until your meeting gets to the front of the queue before that investor has, um, has the details to understand how they might want to vote on that meeting. So this is going to give investors more time um, in, this, in the cycle of a meeting from announcement to a vote um, to um, after they've made their decision. And that opens up opportunities for engagement. <coughs> So the other area of technology I'm going to be, uh, you know, fairly quick because I see the clock's really ticking, um, <clears throat> is uh, blockchain. So we've, we've worked quite a lot on blockchain technology and we see it um, as, as very advantageous as many people do, particularly in the areas of capital markets. Um, <clears throat> so I, I'm not going to spend too much time talking about blockchain. Um, it's obviously in the press a lot. Um, but really, it's, it's a cryptographically secure way of sharing information. So if you like, you can, you can share things while still effectively being secret. And there's lots of advantages to that. Um, <clears throat> you know, and, and some of those are, are, as it says here, security, privacy, and, and integrity, all things that are really important when it comes to voting and when it comes to, to other aspects of engagement. <clears throat> So um, what have we been doing? Well, um, one thing that, that we've put some information out about is um, using blockchain for managing a general meeting. Today, general meeting processes can be cumbersome. They can lack transparency. It can be difficult for investors just to, to vote. It can also be expensive. Um, <clears throat> but blockchain is a, is a technology that is um, traceable. Uh, blockchain is... Um, um, is, is there forever. There's no way of manipulating it. So it can be a great mechanism to record meeting information and record votes. But it's also cheap <clears throat> um, once it's set up. So, so after the initial cost, the actual incremental cost of announcing a meeting and collecting votes is, is relatively low. And that has loads of opportunities. And it has opportunities, first of all, for, if you like, saving money for local um, custodian banks and other intermediaries in a chain. But long term, it can be easier to, <coughs> to excuse me, um, to um, manage your voting in more interesting ways. And some of those ways might include retail investors being able to pass their votes to third party firms to make decisions on their behalf. <coughs> excuse me. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we see with greater desire for retail investors to do that and technology enabling it. A great opportunity. Finally, another area we've been working on and we launched recently was a shareholder disclosure product. So for issuers, the first part of understanding um, how to engage with your shareholders is to know who your shareholders are. Um, <clears throat> so what we've seen with the shareholder rights directive, a new regulatory tools for issuers to do that, but there's still technology barriers to understanding who your shareholders are. Um, we use blockchain to do that. We've worked with a number of banks to build a network so that an, an issue, a corporate issue, a company can make a request and those banks can respond in a way um, to, to, thank you very much, yeah. <clears throat> 
on the road too much. Too many flights, I think, recently. Um, <clears throat> um, to respond to, uh, um, to that request and provide um, information. But in the long term, blockchain is not just efficient for a new tool, but it's transformative because that um, shareholder disclosure process can turn into, through a blockchain, a proof of entitlement for an underlying shareholder. That enables greater cooperation because now shareholders can um, work cooperatively without even disclosing who they are and in a way that absolutely proves that those shares are controlled. So where today it may be common for single shareholders to announce shareholder resolutions in order to move over that threshold. In the future, through the use of, of technologies like blockchain, shareholders can more easily come together en masse in order to reach an appropriate threshold to start um, putting those new resolutions on the board. So, I mean, that's you know really quick. Obviously, we could spend loads of time talking in more detail about the technology and, and how that might happen. Um, but, but those are the kind of changes we see in the future. Those are technologies that are really here. Um, some of them might be a bit slower than others. Uh, for instance, there's lots of voting processes that exist today, so um, it's more expensive, for, or perhaps it's a bit slower, to move on to a blockchain solution for meetings. It's probably not going to happen tomorrow, but it will happen in the future because it's market forces. Um, <clears throat> but we do see shareholder disclosure is obviously coming in really next year, so, so um, lots of change coming up. And, and as I say, I think we see a significant change in these areas, and they can be a positive or a negative. So harnessing the retail vote for a company can be a very positive thing. But we also see retail investors being continually interested um, and increasingly interested in particularly ENS resolutions. So again, looking at experience in the US where retail investors tend to vote in larger numbers, we see them often supporting shareholder resolutions in those topics. Uh, and so, you know, if you're not really engaged with your retail investor and not engaged with the technology to understand who they are and understand how they're voting, they may well start taking stronger lines on those kind of things. So perhaps not tomorrow, but, but you know, maybe in the future. But there we go. So that's uh, my very brief um, uh, technology. Please, thank you very much. Thank you.